And welcome to this session, Certifying Origin, uh, Managing Global Trade in a Changing World. And that it's a um, changing world is obviously an understatement. Um, global trade, as, we, as we've known it, will not be the same as we will hopefully emerge from this, from this global crisis. I um, just want to see if, Todd, are you sharing your screen? Um, yes. I am right. now. Can All you right. hear me okay? Yes, yes. So the question is, how can blockchain technology facilitate frictionless free trade um, as we will hopefully, you know, trying to reboot the global economy? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, my name is Dennis Post. I am a tax partner with EY and I lead our global blockchain efforts in tax and I will be your uh, host for this session. Um, so today we're going to talk about, you know, one of the platforms I am most passionate about, which is the origin platform. But before doing so, I just want to introduce today's panelists. So first of all, we have Todd Smith. So Todd is a global trade partner with, with EY, and he's also a licensed customs broker. Um, also with us today is Raquel Javara from Microsoft. Um, Raquel is part of Microsoft's global tax and trade team. Um, then I'm also very glad that we have with us today Vincent Annunciato. Vinny is a director of U.S. Customs and Border Control, and Vinny's basically involved with everything USCPB is doing around emerging technology, um, uh, su such as blockchain. And then last but not least, we have with us today John Robotham, our tech lead from the Advanced Technology Tax Lab uh, in, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as Frank Putman, a manager from our blockchain and tax team, who is the product manager uh, for the Origin platform. So welcome, everybody. Um, all right, Todd, so, so let's start with you. You know, given your background and experience as a, as a customs broker, why don't you, you know, set the scene a little bit and help us identify the problem that so many companies are facing in the world of global trade today and why you think the Origin platform can potentially help solve that problem? Thank you, Dennis. Um, I appreciate that. We, we have a, a diverse group of attendees with different levels of experience in regard to origin. And so to frame our discussion, I wanted to first provide a basic overview of origin before getting into what we are solving for. So in the context of global trade, country of origin is used by customs agencies around the world to determine whether goods qualify for preferential treatment, for example, under a free trade agreement like NAFTA or the new USMCA, or for non-preferential treatment that can subject imported goods to anti-dumping duties or retaliatory trade measures like, like the China 301 tariffs. Information about the origin of a good is also used by customs for admissibility purposes. For example, goods manufactured with forced labor or certain species of wood, are restricted from being imported into certain countries. In terms of how origin is determined, typically information found in a bill of materials or a bomb is used to determine if a specific rule of origin for a good is satisfied. Based on the analysis of the rules of origin, a manufacturer can attest to the country of origin of its goods in the form of a certificate of origin or a CO. And we'll be talking about these as we go through the, um, through the panel. But to be sure, what you'll, what you'll see during our panel is much more than a track and trace, farm to table, wholly produced origin solution. We are really solving for a complex, multi-party, multiple steps and multiple component origin determinations, which can be quite complex. So how prevalent are companies and customs authorities dealing with origin determinations issuing certificates of origin and auditing the accuracy of, of origin claims. Just to put things in perspective, there are over 480 free trade agreements and each agreement has numerous product specific rules of origin, which can be very complex. For example, there are over 2000 rules of origin for auto and auto parts um, contained in the NAFTA free trade agreement, which is now USMCA. Um, so by our estimates, there are over 700,000 different rules of origin across all these free trade agreements around the world. Also, 50% or 9.7 trillion in goods are traded under, uh, under preferential agreement. But many manufacturers lack the experience and training to interpret the rules of origin for their goods, which may be why um, a study 
by the World Customs Organization showed that uh, the 22% of certificates of origin had irregularities or, or, or they wouldn't pass a customs audit. So to put that level of non-compliance into perspective, the average rate of duty for manufactured goods is 10% globally. And that translates into an at-risk duty savings pool of close to 220 million per year around origin compliance. So, okay, you, you may be thinking, all right, origin, origin is important and, and lots of companies are benefiting from preferential trade, trade programs. What are some of the problems and how will blockchain help with origin compliance? Um, I've been assisting clients with country of origin determinations and through customs audits for the past 20 years. And when I learned about some of EY's other successful blockchain projects um, at last year's blockchain summit, I began formulating the idea of, of a vendor agnostic blockchain platform and ecosystem. So today, um, exporters or manufacturers issue certificates of origin to their customers because customs regulations require that the certificates be obtained and, and on hand at the time um, and a, a good is imported and the importer wants to claim um, a free trade or preferential treatment. Today, all the parties in the supply chain have their own systems and in most cases, they don't, they don't talk to one another. So the exporters issue certificates and, and they are usually selling the same part to multiple customers and each customer requires the certificate for the same part in different formats like email, PDF, fax, FTP, file upload, et cetera. We're talking hundreds of thousands of parts each year go through this process. So, so lots of inefficiency and redundancy and, and human effort. Also, whereas the bomb is needed to back up the certificate of origin um, so that you can interpret the rules of origin, um, manufacturers are understandably reluctant to share sensitive bomb component pricing and supplier information. Blockchain resolves these inefficiencies and, and confidentiality concerns because, because access to the bomb data is based on permission. Um, having permission access to the bomb and other supporting data will also enable third parties who, who issue certificates of origin like approved government agencies, um, and chambers of commerce to efficiently access the bomb data. This will solve a massive knowledge gap by um, facilitating independent FTA knowledge experts specializing in those 700,000 or so complex rules of origin I just, I just spoke about and, and review the bomb and essentially certify that the certificate of origin being issued by the manufacturer is in fact accurate and will pass a customs audit. You'll see how this shows up on a bomb during, um, during Frank's UI demo in just a moment. Um, for importers who want to claim free trade agreement duty benefits, they need to solicit or obtain these certificates from, from the manufacturers and suppliers. This is also currently done via email and, and is a costly time consuming process. Besides not meeting the requirements of a particular rule of origin today, most certificates are, are, are static and, and cover all shipments of the same good for a full year of production. So changes to component pricing or suppliers during the production year that might disqualify a previously um, certified good are, are, are rarely communicated. Um, which is one of the reasons why the at-risk pool is in fact so high. So the origin blockchain will, will automate and streamline the solicitation process. It will reduce risk because changes to the bomb that either help qualify or disqualify trade benefits will be instantaneously updated on the origin blockchain's distributed ledger as, as John will discuss in just a minute. And then at the border, the origin blockchain will benefit customs because unlike today, when, when customs needs to verify an origin claim, um, unlike today, they will be able to instantaneously access the, the, the original uh, immutable bomb data that was recorded to the origin blockchain when the certificate was first issued, provided the manufacturer grants customs access. Again, the manufacturer sensitive bomb data can be kept confidential um, um, from their customers via the origin blockchain. So, so this, this vendor agnostic um, origin blockchain is going to truly revolutionize how origin compliance and admissibility is managed today 
by both industry and customs authorities around the world, and we're, we're real excited about it. So I guess you know, with that um, background, Dennis, I'll turn it back to you now. All right, Todd, thank you very much. And that does indeed sound like a very serious problem we're trying to solve here um, with some big numbers involved and, and obviously also a, a perfect use case for, for blockchain. All right, so, so let's move over to, uh, to Raquel. Raquel, obviously, you know, we're at EY are very excited to have EY or to have, sorry, to have Microsoft, obviously, as the first user of the, of the Origin platform. Can you help maybe, you know, talk a little bit about why, you know, this is so important for, for, for Microsoft to actually use blockchain for purposes of Origin determinations? Sure, thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Todd. It's a pleasure to be here with you and talk a little bit about blockchain and how we can benefit Microsoft. So when, when we look at um, origin and any other information we declare for crossing border, one of the things that we look at it is the compliance. So are we compliant with the rules and regulations required for crossing border? The second one is accuracy of the data. So is the data that I'm declaring accurate? Um, the third one is really around uh, the, the operations and streamlining for operation, having an efficient process in place. And the fourth, which is really a, an attended consequence of blockchain is the ability to run simulation and what if scenarios. So breaking this down a little bit, um, we are super excited to be able to look at the compliance aspect of it. And with blockchain, we see a possibility of you know, better qualify for preferential rules, uh, for procurement rules. So when I think about, you know, Buy American Act, BAA or TAA, fulfilling, you know, government orders um, or qualifying, as Todd mentioned, to free trade agreements. Um, and even if we think about scenarios, most recent scenarios like 301, in our ability to really um, understand our bill of material, our suppliers and our supply chain, and being able to be agile around understanding and analyzing that, I think blockchain will play a very critical role for us to be able to drive that compliance. Um, when I think about the accuracy of the data, I think Todd mentioned as well. So currently we really center our operations on a static certificate of origin that's provided by the supplier when we procure our products, our end product having the ability, again, to have a dynamic process in which we have um, accurate information at the time we are crossing border is critical. Um, and last but not least, I think it's the streamline of the operation. The process today is time consuming, is, is email based. Um, it does require a lot of back and forth between us and suppliers. So I think that will also be a great benefit of having blockchain. And, uh, and I'm very passionate about technology. So when I think about uh, the unattended consequences of blockchain, I see the ability to really uh, run what if scenarios uh, to bring to classification. So if I, I think that I have the bill of material information um, and I can uh, look at my components and I look at my final product, I can actually apply rules of classification in a similar way that I would apply country foraging or preferential rules in place. So we are super excited uh, to be the first customer and to be here. I think for the company, it's gonna be a great win. All right, thank you, Raquel. And you know, really um, exciting to see that Microsoft also wants to be on the forefront with this. All right, so, so let's go over to uh, Vincent Annunciato. Vinny, I think it would be good for the audience to, uh, to hear your thoughts on the US CPB perspective. So um, why do you think blockchain will help customers enforce the various duty benefit programs and other requirements that depend on knowing the country of origin for imported goods? Dennis, thank you very much. By the way, I can't start the video unless you give me access. So I'm um, just letting you know. Um, we'll work on that, so. Yeah, there we go. There you are. All right, yeah. here I am. All right, so. Um, there's a certain irony here, Dennis. Um, and, and by the way, thank you very much for, for having me as a part of this event. Uh, very exciting work that we're doing with blockchain. And, and thank you for Todd uh, for inviting me to this panel. Um, one of the uh, ironies here is that about two, two and a half years ago when I first started in blockchain, uh, the executive assistant commissioner, Brenda Smith, specifically asked me to go out and find the country of origin. So, 
I can't think of any better timing uh, for uh, this type of software. Um, there's a lot of value for CBP. Obviously, uh, having the supply chain visibility uh, so that we can know not only where, where items are manufactured, but also where the goods are supplied from is of the utmost importance. In fact, uh, if you look at a lot of the news that we've been generating early, uh, we've been generating um, over the past couple of years, a lot of what we're looking at right now is for that pre-arrival, pre-release data. Um, not only is it important for us to know the, you know, the aspects of the visibility from the manufacturing and where the materials are coming from, but how do you derive duty rates once it um, is entered into the country? And this will help make it a lot easier. Um, there's one other aspect of this that I think also stems from this, and that is that the blockchain technology will not only help us see where the uh, origin is, but also start to look at the validity of the companies that are handling these products. So I think it's a win-win situation for everyone. All right, thank you, Vinny. And it sounds to me like USCPB um, really wants to be on the forefront of this um, also. Um, you know, driving emerging technology to the next level. All right, so um, we've talked about, you know, the business problem we're trying to solve in the world of global trade. And, and you know, I've heard some interesting perspectives from the Microsoft side as well as from U USCPB. So let's move over to, to John Robotham. You know, John, you know, as our, you know, tech lead, why don't you, um, you know, um, give us some insights on what's under the hood of the origin platform uh, in terms of architecture, tokens we're using, smart contracts, and other technical merits. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Dennis. So um, before we show you a demo of the product that we're working on, I just want to go over some of the major concepts that really do underpin this whole technical design. And the place to start with is the basic workflow. And in this workflow, the, the center of that workflow is some kind of producer who's looking for trade benefits um, using origin. So this, this producer could be an auto manufacturer, could be an electronics manufacturer, could be a pharmaceutical company or, or you know, a furniture maker. It really doesn't matter. The, the system is pretty agnostic as to who the exporter is. Um, it's just that they are looking for benefits of um, using origin. So anytime you produce a good of any type, you have a bill of materials that underlies it. Um, in this example here, we're just using a very, very simple bill of materials that only has three components to it. You know, in the real world, you'd have dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of components. Um, but, you know, for this, we're just going to look at, at a few. So in this case, we'll look and see that this manufacturer, this producer, has two suppliers. Um, each of them had previously already obtained their certificates of origin from their suppliers. Um, and so they, they have those all available. This is typically done, you know, the, obtaining this is typically done before the production process begins. So now this, this producer, this manufacturer, needs to get their own certificate of origins and they need them for each of the components. So through this system, what they do is, is they make requests for the certificate of origin or CO as it's called. So they've made those requests to their two different suppliers and on the blockchain, the suppliers will be able to send tokens and these tokens represent a certificate of origin. So it's essentially the digital equivalent of a paper certificate of origin, but now it's being recorded right on the blockchain in an immutable form. So the producer now has those two different certificates of origin for two of their key components. They can then themselves run their own free trade software which can determine with the rule of origin. And in this case, they're using something called a regional value content or RVC, and that has a certain threshold. And looking at having those two certificates of origin, they've now met that threshold. 
So by meeting that threshold, they can now are qualified to be able to do their own certificates of origin. So these manufacturers themselves have their own customers. So here we have two customers of that manufacturer, and it's the same process again. Again, mediated through this system, mediated through the blockchain. So they themselves, their customers, are going to make their own requests for certificates of origin. And the producer can reply by issuing certificate of origin covered tokens. So what you can see is this is a process that can go from many, many different levels of a, of a multi-tier supply chain. And it's also applicable to basically any kind of, of producer, any kind of importer, any kind of exporter. We, we envision having various industries all participating in the same, um, in the same blockchain. So at any point in time, any of these producers can talk to a third party expert who would also be members of this blockchain ecosystem. And there could be many different third party experts. They could review the information on that certificate of origin review that, that bill of materials, which as Todd has mentioned, the bill of materials itself is not on the blockchain, um, is instead being referenced through the blockchain. Um, and they can review that and apply their certification. Now, this can provide a lot more confidence in that certificate of origin. And in some countries, there's actually a requirement for government or a government authorized agency to provide that certification before the good can be shipped. Now, speaking of the government and the customs authorities, they, on the other hand, could go anytime into various places in this blockchain and trace the flow of tokens, request the data that would, is needed in order to back this certificate of origin, request the evidence, and do their own verification. So this, this third party expert certification could happen for any place on this blockchain. Similarly, the customs could be making their inquiries at any point and then use the information in the blockchain to be able to trace as far back as they want to in terms of checking for that validity. So we've now taken a look at, at the basic workflow now let's see how it would be implemented on the blockchain. And in this system, there's three primary modes of communication. The core of it, the center of it is of course the blockchain and these tokens that we've talked about flowing through the blockchain. And every party can have their own node if they wish to, or multiple parties can share a single node. Um, but every node has its own immutable copy of the blockchain, giving them a lot of confidence in that data. Now, in addition to the information that's on the blockchain, every node can be talking to their own local databases, talking to their own ERP systems, talking to their own free trade agreement software, and all that data is off the blockchain but it's then being communicated you know, as the blockchain provides transactions. Now we talked about the idea of, of people being able to exchange confidential information. And so what we have for the third central part of the system is a set of point-to-point -point communication paths for being able to move the confidential information, but it's not on the blockchain, it's used in combination of secure messaging and REST APIs to be able to put this together. So then if you look at any one of these nodes on this blockchain network, you can ask, what does the software stack look like there? And here's a picture of that software stack. At the bottom is infrastructure as a service. It could be from any kind of cloud manufacturer, or it could be um, a private data center participating and having their own node. Um, the layer on top of it is really important. This is the origin core solution. This core solution is the data that runs on the blockchain. It's those tokens, it's those transactions that we were just talking about. 
it's really important to note that EY fully intends to make this open. Um, and in fact, as Todd will describe later, our intent is, is to be able to turn over the governance of that core solution to an independent, neutral third party organization that can help grow and manage this. And it means that anyone who wants to participate will be able to participate in this network. It, you know, it will be an open solution. Now, on top of that is the interaction and integration layer. And that interaction integration layer is what supports the user interface. And we'll be seeing some user interface in a few minutes. And it's also the software that connects to every member's um, ERP system, their enterprise system. So the enterprise systems don't change, but they are all now connected to each other through this blockchain-based solution. So now that we've taken a look at the technical architecture, I'm gonna turn this over to Frank Putman. And Frank is the product manager for EY's origin platform. So take it away, Frank. Thanks, John. So I will now take you to a quick run through of the UI of the application. And this will uh, follow the same basic flow as the one that John just explained. So we're now assuming to be the entity in the middle, the manufacturer who will set up a bill of materials in the system. And uh, that's the first thing we'll do. We'll go to the bill of materials section and create a new one. And the first step is to specify some basic, basic details about the product. Um, and this is information that is usually in the header of a bill of materials. So it's um, details about the qualification of the good uh, and some uh, values like uh, the, the cost value, sales value, labor and overhead cost. So the next step is to select the preference program we want to ship this product under. It is possible to uh, select multiple. So this, in this example, we will select uh, NAFTA. And because we select NAFTA, some uh, NAFTA specific questions will pop up. So if we've answer, answered those, we can move on to the uh, most important screen in this application, which is the add components overview where we can actually build our bill of materials and add components to it. And there are two things I would like to point out on this screen. Uh, the first one is the uh, analytics you will see at the top of the screen, uh, which is basically showing you whether you meet the relevant uh, rules and thresholds under the selected trade program, such as NAFTA. But if you would have selected multiple, you could of course switch between those. And uh, the second thing I would like to point out is the option to import a bill of materials file instead of manu manually adding components, which would, we will do now. So now we will manually add a third party certified component to our bill of materials. And now we will see that we are well on our way to meeting some of the relevant thresholds under NAFTA. However, we are not there yet. We need to add some more components. So we will select one which is uh, self-certified by a supplier and also one which is not yet certified by a supplier. So uh, now we've added more components and we should have enough components to meet the relevant thresholds. However, we are missing a CO for the third part. And the application lets us easily request this uh, CO from the supplier uh, on the blockchain. So if we click send, uh, send request, we will see a CO request going out on the blockchain, which means we are now ready for the next step, which is to add a certificate of origin to our bill of materials. So we can either uh, add an existing certificate or we can create a new one. And if we create a new one, it will uh, pre-populate all the field, it's fields it already knows based on the information provided before. Um, so it will ask some NAFTA specific questions. And if we now create the CO, it will be published as a uh, contract on the blockchain. So now we can save and continue. And the next step is to add um, documentation supporting documentation to the bill of materials um, and Todd not the whole the, the whole screen isn't visible anymore it's only part so uh, we can review our bill of materials and uh, because we are missing a CO we will not publish the uh, bill of materials but we will save it as a draft so now we see a new metric in our draft bomb screen which is the coverage level uh, which is uh, basically specifies to what extent your bill of materials is backed up by actual COs received from suppliers. 
and uh, we were still missing one CO. So now we can log out as the manufacturer and log in as the supplier we sent the CO request to. So if we now log in as that supplier, we should see the uh, incoming uh, request from the manufacturer we just sent in this screen. And we can respond either by creating uh, a new CO and issuing it or by finding and issuing a CO we already set up in the system previously. So uh, we will select the first option. Uh, it will pre-populate a table with the available options. We can select one review it against the original request from the manufacturer and then issue the CO. So now a token, CO token will go from the supplier to the manufacturer. So if we now log out as the supplier and log back in as the manufacturer, we should be able to see the uh, CO token we just received from a supplier. So we go to supplier COs and here we see the token we just received. So now we can review it. And we can review it against our original request and if it meets our expectations, we can accept it, which is also a transaction on the blockchain. So if we now move back to our uh, draft bill of materials, we see it has a coverage level of 100%. So we're fully covered, which means if we now go back into the bill of materials flow, we can uh, go to the component screen where we now see we meet the relevant threshold. Under NAFTA, we meet the RVC net cost method, which has a check mark because we received a self-certified CO from a supplier. So now we only have to review our final bill of materials. And as you can see, everything checks out. Um, and now we can publish our bill of materials contract on the blockchain. And uh, now we should have a 100% covered bill of materials contract uh, on the blockchain. And also we created the uh, certificate of origin contract previously. So we have a, a fully covered bill of materials and a uh, certificate of origin uh, contract set up and this allows us as a manufacturer to now issue CO tokens to our own um, customers. So now we see an example of that. So a CO token flowing from the manufacturer who has a fully covered uh, bill of materials and a certificate of origin uh, for, for NAFTA in this case can now issue a CO token to its own customers. And uh, that concludes uh, the demo. All right, Frank. Well, thanks for this. And, um, you know, this looks awesome. And I know that you guys work really hard to, uh, to get this all ready uh, for the summit. Um, Raquel, you know, definitely don't want to put you on the spot here, but, you know, any comments from, from your end after having seen this? Yeah, so I think, you know, as I see John and Frank talking about the technology and all the aspects of, you know, the, the maintaining the accuracy of the data, I really think about the operations itself where I see, um, you know, the users and taking the human factor out of the analysis on origin determination, preferential rules, and the ability to expand on that uh, with, you know, technology like automation, robots. I think, I think it really opens up for um, a lot of the optimization that we need within the supply chain. Right. All right. Thank you, Raquel. So, um, you know, in the meantime, um, you know, we're getting already a lot of questions um, in, in the Q&A, so that's really awesome. But before going there, um, you know, Todd, there's one thing that I, I want to address with, with you. And obviously, this year's theme for the summit is, is going public. And we've seen a lot of presentations, and we've heard Paul and Joe Lubin and others talk about it yesterday. Um, and in line with that theme, we obviously want the Origin Public Blockchain to also have as many companies and as many customs agencies as possible. But the question is, how are we going to do that, right? Can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what I think are two of the most, you know, striking issues when it comes to, to blockchain? One, how are we going to create that multi-party ecosystem? And secondly, what level of government, uh, governance is actually needed to make that happen? Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, something with, that we're giving... Uh a lot of thought about Dennis and um, the, the thinking around that is that we are planning to establish a governance board um, that that EY actually won't ultimately be a member of because of, of independence from our own our own audit clients and as John said um, you know this will be put into and moved into the core platform will be moved into the public domain EY won't own it 
Um, so so we, we envision that this governance board will set field level standards, functionality, and API specifications so that the um, so that the origin platform will be interoperable with existing ERP and FTA management software systems, customs administration systems, and other chain platforms. Um, we envision the governance board will will receive input on standards from several stakeholders, including uh, what I call trade facilitators, um, such as carriers, customs brokers, trade finance banks, law firms, FTA software providers other customs consultants, um, and, 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 and then the governance board will also have what I call observers. And, and these observers um, would consist of regulators, customs authorities, um, and, and global policy setting organizations like, like perhaps the World Customs Organization and the International Chambers of Commerce, for example. There are others. Um, and, then, and then from the users of the origin platform, we, we, we envision the formation of industry sector subcommittees or, or of, the, of the governance board itself. And, and those sector committees would be, um, as, we're, as we're envisioning it, in the automotive sector, the industrials sector, technology, um, consumer products, and life sciences, each of whom would, would advocate for their own unique standards and, and, and communicate those up to the specifications board. Um, ultimately, again, the core platform that John discussed will be moved into the public domain and, and the governance board would hire firms, um, private firms to make in-kind contributions to update and enhance the capabilities of, of the core platform. That's the thinking. All right, Todd, sounds awesome. So as I said, in the meantime, we're getting a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A already. Um, I'm not sure whether we can address all of those today in this session, but obviously we'll try to address those separately, um, you know, later on. So Ra Raquel, there's one, one question actually, um, I'm, I wanna direct this one to you. Uh, hopefully you can help us with that one. So what type of companies do you think will ultimately participate in the, uh, in the public origin platform? Yeah, so thank you, Dennis. So I think about, you know, the complexity of the bill of material and the diversity of the supply chain um, really will determine the industries that will benefit from it. I cannot think about an industry that I would exclude from benefiting of it, but I think the automotive industry, pharmaceutical technology, of course, I think those are industries that have, you know, diverse supply chain. They have um, a multitude of suppliers, they have complex components and layers of components. So when I think, for example, about, you know, some of the Microsoft Bureau of Materials and what makes our boards and subboards, um, I see that as a lot of opportunity to, to, again, streamline and ensure the compliance through that. Um, so again, I wouldn't exclude any industry. I think big importers, exporters, um, Automotive is an industry that definitely jumps up to me just because the complexity of their of their bill of material. Right. All right. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, all right. So we have another question. I think Vinny, this one has has your name on it. Definitely. It's about the future of technology. Um, it's all about. So what role do you think should you know customs agencies like USCPB play? Should they like you know lean back and just have you know facil facilitate companies that are driving this? or you know, play an active role in this? And should they run nodes on, on, on platforms like this? What, what is your, your take on this? It's a great question, Dennis. Um, obviously, I can't speak for every uh, customs authority out there, so I'll speak for the US. Um, but wh what we're doing right now is we're really trying to take a, a very holistic, a visionary approach to blockchain. Um, we're already deeply uh, invested into standards. We've been working with DHS Science and Technology Directorate um, uh, doing things with the W3C uh, to try and help this out so that we can reduce the cost for businesses and also increase market adoption. Um, you know, one of the things that I do want to bring up in that proactivity realm, Dennis, is that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that blockchain is the answer for everything. Obviously, there's, there's always issues with software and, and, and there's other technologies that need to be included when looking at the blockchain position. But really what it has done for us is really opened our minds in looking at what we term the team sport of data. Um, and that means that everybody in the supply chain is now issuing data on that supply chain, which is something that we haven't gotten before. 
Um, and the downstream event of this is that the approach is going to move us from a paper-based system into a completely digitized, informationally-based system. Um, and all of this is going to be in real time. So it, it's really fantastic to look at. And um, just to kind of close out, just imagine a world in the future where all of the data um, from the, the, the point that the product is made coming off the manufacturing line is tracked seamlessly all the way to the, the consumer. And not only do we see that, but the consumer is also able to look on their phone and check out the legitimacy of a product. Talk about being able to um, engage in greater safety and more efficiency. It's a very exciting prospect for the future. All right, awesome. Thank you, Vinny. Um, so we have so many, you know, very interesting questions. So here's a, here's a you know, it's hard to choose, but here, here's another one. Um, John, you know, I guess this one's for you. Um, will the platform be public and allow customers who already invested in FTA systems, like, you know, um, interact with the platform and use it for the connectivity with customers and suppliers? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. And I'm just going to refer back to the last diagram that flashed up, I'm sure, very fast. Um, the way we see this is, is that at that core solution, we're moving around these tokens that represent the certificates of origin, but we will integrate with existing FTA rules, engines, existing software. The idea is not to replace existing systems, but to supplement them and provide that connectivity amongst all the participants, including the customs agencies, to be able to exchange that information um, without obsoleting this. So the, the, the smart contracts that underlie this are not trying to calculate those um, percentages. They're, instead, what they're doing is they're interacting with software that would run on, on each node in the network and allow people to use their own free trade agreement software or they could also refer it to third parties who could provide that as a service right there on that blockchain. So that, I think right. that's, that's the basic way we see this. All right, thank you, John. So, okay, so we, you know, the questions keep on coming, but you know, Todd, I think this one has your name on it. Um, some countries require a government agency or a chamber of commerce to actually issue a certificate of origin. Can they also participate in this platform? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, what, what we're doing by introducing this notion of having a third party certify a certificate of origin that the manufacturer may be responsible for issuing, um, you know, isn't intended to uh, replace what um, a free trade agreement right now may already require, which is, as you just said, or as the as the, the question raised is, you know, some free trade agreements between countries require a, an authorized agency authorized by a government to actually issue the certificate of origin. So the third party in this instance could be that agency. It could be also a lot of, a lot of um, chambers of commerce around the world um, today issue certificates of origin. Um, you know, we would envision possibly even, even those chambers utilizing this platform um, to, to issue certificates of origin in, in the future. So um, one agnostic platform that, uh, whether it's a government agency that's issuing at a chamber or um, a third party expert, could be a customs broker that has specialty in origin determinations would be able to unlock the underlying documentation uh, put on the, um, not put on the blockchain, but um, recorded on the blockchain um, and, and review that information and then basically attest that that information, you know, if push came to shove under a Vinny customs audit uh, for origin, it would be instantaneously available and they could uh, feel comfortable that they can claim free trade agreement benefits using mm -hmm. that data. All right, thanks, Todd. Uh, again, we have so many questions. Um, we'll address them separately. I think we're almost at the end of our session. I just wanna you know, say one, one more thing. Maybe, Todd, you can pull that last slide up. So if you have any you know, other questions or technical questions or practical questions, but even more so, if you're you know, just as excited as we are and you're saying, hey guys, I, I'm, I'm in, I wanna do a pilot, 
you know, just send out uh, an, an email to origin at ey.com and we'll be in touch and, and we'll make that happen. And I think with that, we've come to the end of our session and I, I would really like to thank our panelists for, for joining today, but obviously also our audience um, for, for listening and tuning in. Um, it's been great to have you here. And then with that, um, Paul, I wanna give it back to you. Thank you, Dennis. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I, I really loved it. Even when Vinny said that blockchain is not the solution for everything, I still, I still managed to see the good in your presentation. So um, I also, I do want to, a, a couple of extra shout outs. First of all, I want to say an extra special thank you to Microsoft over and over again, whether it's as a client, as a partner, as a development uh, set of expertise. Uh, you know, one of the things that we heard a lot early on in our time in the world of blockchain was, we go to clients, we go to companies, be like, hey, we have this vision of doing stuff. And the, and the clients would be like, that sounds fantastic. Uh, we'd love to do this. Uh, sounds great. You go first. You come back to us when you got somebody else to do this. And Microsoft over and over again has been a partner who has been willing to go first, which for which I, I cannot possibly be uh, more grateful. Uh, secondly, uh, a quick uh, just shout out back to the, the Origin team. What you saw there today was in that demo video was a, an advance on some of the progress that has been made around uh, blockchain uh, a user interface, right? Simplifying things, creating APIs that make it easy to access uh, the blockchains and actually hide a lot of the complexity from enterprise users. So uh, those two things. We are, I wanna answer just a couple quick questions here that we get over and over. Number one, the replay of this. So this will be available probably a couple of hours after the session complete to be able to go on and, and uh, watch this anytime you want. Uh, number two, uh, presentations, we're gonna post them to the, the, the same page as you registered for the summit. We'll post them overnight, actual uh, pre presentations. And we are, we are gathering up the, the pending questions. So we are going to, uh, we're gonna um, uh, uh, try our best to answer those over time. Now, let me uh, uh, turn back to our celebrity guests. Uh, I wanna start with Megan. And, and before we do anything else, I, I just wanna, I give you a moment because I failed to do this before. Talk to us about your company, Better Ledger, what you do, and uh, uh, your um, your kind of vision and thoughts for the future. Oh, uh, you're muted still. Sorry. Okay, here there we go. So, uh, Very Ledger is a company I started. We just turned two years old last week, and we build accounting software for businesses. So, companies that are transacting in cryptocurrencies, right? It's uh, has historically been a fairly manual process to be able to go through and reconcile those transactions. So we just look to automate that process. We integrate with QuickBooks. We work with some of the coolest companies uh, building on top of Ethereum. So that's what we do. Uh, we act as an outsourced uh, accounting office. Fantastic, thank you very much. And, and let me ask you, uh, Lou, to do the same, which is tell us about Crypto Mondays. Sure, so Crypto Mondays is a meetup that we started uh, in New York uh, on January 8th, 2018, uh, which is meaningful because that was the peak day of crypto market cap. <laughs> um, and it's now held in 57 cities uh, around the world, uh, including Los Angeles, uh, San Juan, Miami, London, Paris, Tel Aviv, Shanghai, Singapore, uh, and on and on. And it's just to, to help uh, people in the crypto community get together. Uh, most of the meetings have uh, people who are doing fireside chats or panels. And now that we are obviously on lockdown all over the world, uh, Crypto Mondays happens in VR, which has really been interesting. I think VR is gonna go up and to the right. It's one of the things that's really, you know, it's a technology that was happening anyways. Uh, and now with coronavirus, I think the adoption is going to be massively accelerated. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us on a Wednesday. So, <laughs> uh, um, so tell us, uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Lou. Uh, just give us your quick reactions to Origin, uh, and then we're going to, uh, after, after a quick lightning round of reactions to Origin, I want to turn us towards our closing kind of key discussion today. So let's start with Origin and, and, and trade, global trade. Sure, so yeah, obviously super impressive, uh, great use of, of the blockchain. Uh, and I was most impressed by the fact that uh, it's gonna be an open system. So E and Y isn't gonna control it. They're gonna turn governance over to uh, some type of committee. 
Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's how you turn it into something that's adopted by a much wider audience. So super exciting stuff, congrats. Th thank you very much. And, and also thank you probably for the first time ever in complimenting uh, an accounting firm for governance by committee. Uh, <laughs> I guess the, the key thing was it's just not our committee. So uh, Megan, on, on to you. Yeah, certainly an interesting project to learn about. Uh, subject matter I'm not as familiar with, so it was super informative. Um, you know, it looks like it's increasing automation, which increases efficiency and interoperability between all of these systems. It's just fantastic, but also fundamentally looks at how do these sort of different stakeholders actually interact with one another. So um, I'll be keeping tabs on the project going forward. Excellent. And by the way, I love your t-shirt. Uh, we, we saw in the question, somebody did figure out your prior t-shirt. Uh, so do you want to give them a shout out? Totally. Shout out to Nick Criticos, who cracked the code on my t-shirt, which was accountant. So nicely done, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm just terrible at those things. I, I really, I looked at that t-shirt for like a while and I was like, wow, what is it? <laughs> right. So, but anyway, I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm really glad that somebody got it. Let's turn our attention to, to kind of the, uh, the exciting closing discussion here. Central bank digital currencies. 90%, more than 90% of the world's money is already digital. Why do we need central bank digital currencies or do we? Sure, yeah, so I would say that we, the, you know, our, our international global mon monetary system would certainly benefit by having uh, central bank digital currencies. You know, when we think about uh, the, the kinds of networks we're building, this is really fundamentally the base layer, right? And we've seen lots of different uh, sort of, you know, uh, central banks and, and working groups, the Bank for International Settlements, um, pick up interest on the subject by, you know, pr producing working papers. Um, you know, it will, right, theoretically, right, increase uh, interoperability between central banks and commercial banks, which can only benefit the end consumer. And it really builds that foundation um, from which we all are building our services on top of. So certainly think that it's a worthwhile pursuit. Uh, Lou, what do you think? Uh, look, it, the, the whole world, obviously, for a long time, has been going from paper to, to digital. Uh, and it's about time that central banks did that as well. Uh, what, what I'm most excited about is to the degree that the central banks open it up and allow other people to build new applications on top of it, which can drive you know, all kinds of credible innovation. So this is the thing I'm really struggling with. If it's just moving money from one account to another and it's only dealing with cash, I sort of think we already have a very large amount of uh, uh, central bank kind of digital integration. And it's not clear to me if it's a bunch of central banks all transacting with each other, and they all trust each other quite a bit and they know each other, does it really need to be a decentralized system? The thing that really struck me about China's plans is they envision, at least as far as we can tell, that DCEP, that digital currency electronic payment, will ultimately include smart contracts. And I really think uh, for, for this to work, blockchain has to become, it, it, it has to incorporate smart contracts and B2B transactions. Do we, uh, do we need to be thinking about that as, as we go forward? Yeah, I certainly think so. And that, that is really the fundamental difference, right, between having digital money and having a central bank digital currency, right? Central bank digital currencies have the ability for it to be programmable and our money smarter. Uh, and, you know, it is ultimately the future. It's not just about increasing efficiency. It's about pushing, you know, innovation out. Um, and I see central banks as, you know, being one of the, one of the institutions that can help lead us into that future. Lou, sure. should we have central bank digital currencies on public blockchains? Why make a separate blockchain? Well, I think what you want is, or what the government want, obviously, is to have control over it. Uh, obviously, how much is issued uh, is something that's uh, not going to be decided uh, via a, a decentralized governance. Um, so while it certainly solves for some of the things, that uh, decentralized money solves for. It obviously doesn't solve for other things, but it certainly moves things forward. And again, you know, from, from my perspective, one of the things that makes it so exciting is it, it, it'll probably be the major on-ramp for the vast majority of people around the world. And how long do you think that's gonna take? You said major on-ramp. We're we talking five years, 10 years. How long before the average person uh, in this world, not just the technically sophisticated types, have access to these kinds of central bank digital currencies? Well, I think it's going to depend on where you live. If you live in China, I think it's probably going to be in the next couple of years. Uh, and if you live elsewhere around the world, I think including the United States, uh, it's likely that we're going to take a lot longer than that. 
And Megan, what do you think is the impact, right? Your, your company serves SMBs, right? Small and medium sized business. Is this going to really have a big impact on SMBs? Is this going to change their opportunity to do business? Well, I, you know, ugh, hard to say, right? Uh, you know, I, theoretically, a, a central bank digital currency can open up access um, to those who, you know, to those who might need it. Um, it's unclear how all of these, how, how they, you know, these institutions will structure it. Um, I don't know, TBD. I would hope so. I'm not sure though. Uh, excellent. Well, I'm really looking forward to this session. I want to understand as, as we go forward, uh, how many of your clients are already using some kind of stable coins in their payments, right? If, uh, if I have a stable coin and it's a dollar back stable coin, will I just swap it out for a central bank digital currency, do you think? Do, will people prefer it? I met actually with a central banker uh, and to some degree, they, um, they cited a really interesting uh, example for me. They said they feel that one of the important reasons for having central bank digital currencies is because as cash disappears from people's wallets, the opportunity to have a direct relationship between the central bank and the end consumer is going to disappear. And that's going to affect their ability to really establish and maintain the trust of the people in the financial system. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a consideration. Uh, I think for most, you know, entrepreneurs that are out there right now, that may be less at the front of their mind, honestly, um, just taking a guess. What I think would be hard, you know, at least with some of the clients that I work with, which are really, you know, early adopters in some of this technology is they like using stable coins for a variety of different purposes that you may not be able to use a central bank digital currency for yet, right? Like lending protocols, right? Trying to earn interest off of your um, assets uh, and things like that. So we'll see. It's, it's really about what, what central bank digital currency is going to be great. What are, can we do with it? Um, will be the, the bigger question um, and you know will ultimately I think lead to those smaller sort of SMB adoption. Lou what do you think like when you host your meetups what do people say they're excited about when they talk about central bank digital currencies? You know I, I don't think it's something that a lot of people are talking about here in the United States yet because I think the general belief is is that it's a long ways away. If you go to other countries again like China um, you know, they already, I mean, you know, we don't use a lot of cash here, but everything already there, you know, it, everybody, I, I've been there, I, you, you never use any money, you never even use a credit card, right? It's all just digital, it's all with your phone. And so from that perspective, I think if you live in, a, in countries uh, like that, that the, there's not going to be very much of a, a, of a difference. And I think, well, you know, maybe the major difference uh, might be just an additional layer of, of surveillance. You know, outside of then, again, how much are they going to open this up? How much you talk about smart contracts, right? You know, uh, uh, who are they going to allow to write smart contracts? How open is it really going to be, which is going to drive then how much innovation is it going to enable? You know, I'm so glad you talked about that sort of how open is it going to be? How programmable is it going to be? Because we've had a number of conversations with central banks around the world. And one of the things that they've been clear about is that early on, they want to strictly limit the programmability. Right. They want to avoid a scenario. Can you imagine having a Dow like situation with the actual US dollar or with the, the renminbi? Right. That would be kind of quite extraordinary. So I think we'll see a very, very gradual opening up of, of programmability. The one thing I did want to share is kind of strange. Right. I mean, I, I'm in the category of people who are very, very well financially included. But I have to say in, in the last few years on my trips to China, I have felt more and more financially excluded because uh, uh, until fairly recently, until actually last December, foreigners were not allowed to have WeChat Pay or Alipay accounts. And so I would go to China and I would find myself taking out like uh, uh, my wallet for cash and people are like, I don't want that. And I'm like, but I can't pay. And then we would go through like four different credit cards. It was my first ever experience in what I can only describe as financial exclusion. So, um, you know, uh, there is a danger, I think, that sort of not done properly, people who are outside of the digital environment or outside of the digital infrastructure of that country will indeed find themselves financially excluded.